Okay, it looks like we're ready to get started here. Hello, my name is Heather and I'm on the marketing team here at Eagle Eye Networks. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Today's webinar will discuss the acceleration to cloud post COVID-19. Before we get started, a few things to note. If you have any questions throughout, please type them in the Zoom Q&A box at any time and we'll address them at the end of the webinar. All registrants will also receive a follow-up email from us with the full webinar recording. Now moving on, I'd like to introduce you to Matt Webster, who will be our speaker for today. Matt Webster has 10 years of physical security industry experience, including sales, engineering, and product management roles for both integrators and manufacturers. He specializes in CCTV design and deployment for enterprise scope applications. He's here to lead you through the rest of the presentation. So with that, I'll hand it over to Matt. Hey, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, again, this is my second webinar on behalf of Eagle Eye, so I'm quite excited to uh, present to everyone. We'll be talking about uh, some COVID-19 uh, oriented uh, solutions uh, to think about uh, in terms of, of Eagle Eye and cloud technologies. And uh, just real quick, let me start out by talking about uh, Eagle Eye. Um, and a little bit of history. We, we were founded by a gentleman named Dean Draco, who is the CEO and founder of a little company called Barracuda Networks, um, founded in uh, 2012. Uh, we are currently the largest uh, cloud video surveillance provider worldwide, have a headquarter in Austin, Texas, as well as offices in Tokyo, Amsterdam, and just recently Columbia. And uh, we serve customers in over 80 countries worldwide. So let's talk about cloud if uh, you guys are not familiar um, with it, although I, uh, I believe you are even if you don't realize it. Um, we, we interface with cloud um, service providers, cloud technologies pretty much uh, all day long nowadays, right? So probably one of the best examples of this uh, that everyone is, is, is more than likely familiar with is, is Netflix. Netflix is a uh, obviously a a content provider. They provide you awesome movies, shows, series. They even produce their own stuff. Uh, what's interesting about Netflix, though, is that you you, you subscribe to their service. You pay $9.99 each month, and they curate all this data. They build the technology to, to deliver that to you across a multitude of platforms, whether it's a web browser or a smart device um, and, and everything in between. And, and they make it really look like magic. And that is very important. Um, that's a really important uh, aspect of cloud service providers. Um, they really, uh, a really great cloud service provider does what it does uh, and very, very complicated things. Um, and they make it look very, very easy. And therefore, you know, the, 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 the service, the subscription fees that you pay, uh, obviously, uh, are, are worth uh, the price that they are, right? Another one um, is obviously Amazon. Amazon is sort of a combination. They have a Netflix sort of aspect to it where they have the Prime service and you can stream videos from Prime. But they also have obviously a gigantic marketplace, the world's largest marketplace um, uh, that is a, a cloud-enabled marketplace that brings everyone together and uh, allows them to sell on behalf of uh, smaller companies, on behalf of Amazon, uh, but they centralize sort of the idea of, of an e-commerce marketplace. And obviously Facebook, uh, a cloud-based social networking um, platform, uh, and everything in between. So um, you guys are, are probably very familiar with cloud technologies, but we're gonna get into a little bit uh, deeper as far as uh, how to conceptualize uh, certain platforms, certain services, what they provide, uh, and, and how they are constructed uh, to offer you those services. So real quick, um, I want to talk to you about a very interesting study that was done uh, by Maria DB, uh, which is a large um, sort of data gathering collection analysis uh, group. And um, they, they did a, a poll of uh, small business corporations, uh, large enterprise multinational corporations about their thoughts on cloud technologies um, in um, relation to sort of this newly um, realized COVID-19 situation, quarantining, working outside the office. And uh, first off, what they found is basically 99% or everyone, right? All people have been affected by COVID-19, right? Everyone is quarantining. Um, and 84% of these people believe that this is going to go into uh, 2021, 
right? So we're, we're not out of the woods yet. And, uh, and 74% of them believe that we're going we're gonna to probably experience a second wave towards the end of this year, around October, November. Uh, at least that's what our, our government agencies are, are telling us is that, uh, I mean, right now, actually, we're seeing a, uh, an increase, a spike of, of COVID-19 cases. And um, a lot of people, the vast majority of them, uh, 51%, uh, they, they believe that uh, swapping over to a cloud solutions provider to provide whatever sort of business related service um, is in their best interest, right? Um, this idea of a cloud is, is, is wonderful with that concept of being able to remotely manage or remotely use a certain service. So uh, the idea of uh, being outside of the office and being able to perform whatever sort of functions are necessary um, to your duty uh, remotely, right? So uh, everyone is thinking of cloud. And uh, quite honestly, when we're talking about the low voltage physical security space, which is the industry that we're in, I, I personally believe that everything will be uh, a cloud system for, for many different reasons. We're going to go over a few of them, but uh, obviously this, this concept of, of utilizing a cloud service is quite salient uh, in the public's mind for uh, both you know, normal citizens, small business owners, all the way up to the CEO, CTO, CFOs of, of multinational corporations. Okay. So let's, let's talk about our cloud architecture specifically um, as the title of this slide says not all clouds are built the same. And that is a very important point that we're going to want to illustrate for you. Um, you know, I, I had uh, on two previous slides, we talked about just cloud technologies in general, but there's a lot of um, cloud providers that don't necessarily provide a service. They provide um, an infrastructure, right? So we have Amazon Web Services. We have Microsoft Azure. Um, and many others, right? These are really general purpose cloud um, architecture infrastructure providers. Um, and what's interesting about them is that th these are obviously incredibly large, powerful, um, technologically sophisticated companies, and they offer a, a, a service uh, to a very broad spectrum of, of the marketplace. And what I mean by that is that their cloud infrastructures are what are known as, uh, they're wide and they're tall. And what that means is that depending on the service that you want to put into the cloud, you might require uh, certain things. Maybe you require more storage, right? Maybe you require more processing power. Maybe you require a lot of people to be connected simultaneously. Um, and so these, these large uh, web service providers, cloud service providers, they have, to, they have to accommodate for all these different combinations um, of, 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 uh, re of, of resource requirements for these cloud services to, to work, right? And so they, they build themselves wide and they build, them, build themselves tall. So they have a larger ta target audience. What that ends up doing is that that ultimately drives up the, the pricing for them, right? So you have customers paying for a resource that another customer uh, is, is utilizing, but they might not be, right? And uh, you, you run into issues with regression fees and uh, bandwidth fees and um, basically um, certain certain uh, cloud services, it, it's hard to operate and scale in these types of environments because it can become cost prohibitive. Now, with our cloud, uh, we rack and stack and we own our own cloud. We own, you know, we, we have uh, 11 data centers all over the globe. We rack and stack our own hardware. We build our cloud. We manage it centrally here in Austin, Texas. Uh, and we purposely build all of, all of the hardware the architecture, the systems and services associated, they are all purposely built for our cloud-based VMS platform. And um, what's important about that is that we sort of, we gear ourselves very specifically um, to, to the specific resources, right, that we require to deliver our services. And by doing so, that makes us a lot more cost effective first off, uh, but even more so as we, as we begin to grow out our services, um, our, our model is built to become even more cost effective the more people that we attach to our cloud. So as we grow, and we're already you know, the biggest in the world so far, but as we grow even larger, uh, the idea here is that um, our service costs will go down. Um, and so that's, that's, a, that's very exciting. In fact, last year in March, um, some of our most expensive, longest term, highest resolution uh, storage options um, for our service were uh, cut down as much as uh, half, half of the original cost when we started. So the proof is in the pudding. We've already sort of made that first iteration in, in price reductions, and we expect to do that 
uh, moving forward. So it's, um, you know, very exciting, very advantageous for our customers to adopt uh, our service and grow with us and, and, you know, kind of accrue those savings over the course of time. So um, very, very cool concept there. Um, and then let's, let's just talk about, so, you know, we, we refer to our, um, you know, our service as a vSaaS. Some of you might be familiar with a SaaS model, a software as a service. A vSaaS is a video uh, software as a service. And um, so we, we talk about this concept of service. What are the services we provide? We, we provide a whole host of services. I'm just going to mention one of them, and, and it is cybersecurity. I also mentioned previously that our founder, Dean Draco, was also the CEO and founder of Barracuda Networks, which was one of the first cloud uh, cybersecurity uh, firms out there, right? They, they ended up making, um, you know, uh, spam automatically updated spam filters, and then they moved into intrusion detection devices, and so on and so forth. So they they were uh, they they had a cybersecurity pedigree baked into uh, you know their business model. They've they've then brought that up to us. Dean has brought that to us, and cybersecurity is fundamentally a part of our system. And every everything from um, what our deployed on-prem device does that mitigates uh, or allows for the transmission of our data from a premise up to the cloud and then delivered down to a client. Everything from the device that we deploy to the cloud architecture and the way that we stream it to a client's um, interface, whether it's in a browser or a smart app, everything is secured. It's, it's got end-to-end -end encryption, right? 256 AES encryption. When it gets into our cloud architecture, uh, uh, infrastructure, excuse me, it is uh, stored across three different servers. It is encrypted at rest. It makes it a highly available solution. It makes it a highly redundant solution. Um, these are all uh, what would be referred to as enterprise-level features. To actually accomplish this with a, a normal uh, tr or really a traditional server-based VMS, NVR, DVR, is actually a very, very complicated task. You, it, it, would, it would actually involve a highly skilled, uh, a, a subject matter expert uh, that understands what it takes to uh, create a, a secured solution from end to end to create the high degree of redundancy, the high degree of res resiliency. It would cost a lot of hardware. You would have to pay a specialist. Uh, they would have to manage it. Uh, it's actually very, very complicated to do this. And, and with Eagle Eye, you just plug our device into the internet and all that is accomplished uh, like magic, much much as uh, Netflix does, uh, just right out of the box. And, and so it's, it's very, very important. Cybersecurity from a, um, a video management system perspective has become uh, a very uh, important um, you know, box to check uh, when it comes to deploying the solutions nowadays. Uh, I think in the last recent years, it's really just co come to the forefront that um, when, when we're thinking about um, VMS solutions um, that are remotely managed or, or that, that are managed services, uh, that uh, it, it basically it is, is a prerequisite for, it, for them to have a high degree of, of security uh, fundamentally baked into a product, and, and that's what we do. Um, so very, very cool stuff. We can, at the end of the, at the end of the presentation, if you guys want, we can talk about maybe more of the, the services that we provide as well. And so let's go ahead and talk about uh, some of the things that we've discovered um, in, in lieu of, of being quarantined, right? Um, what, what has happened to us <laughs> uh, after COVID-19 sort of fundamentally changed the way that we go to work and live you know, for the past few, past few months. And the first one that we found is that people were not prepared um, as far as uh, util utilizing their VMS systems remotely, right? So VMS, I, I kind of mentioned this, this in the previous slide, but to uh, securely uh, construct a way to remotely access a VMS system can be compl complicated, right? The most e the easiest way is you just, you know, you port forward a network device out to the internet, which basically, uh, you know, you open up an attack surface, a way that someone can attack that device uh, from, from the internet, which is not good. Um, and then you have to, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, as that data is being streamed to you, uh, it is secure. But typically what happens is um, that's not done, right? People just open up a, 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 an attack surface on their network and they stream unencrypted data over the net, over the, over the WAN and, and, you know, that, that gets by, right? And so they, because they don't have any other way of doing that, right? So then they need to access their stuff remotely. Well, um, obviously being able to do that easily and securely, that, that's, that's a very, very big, uh, that's a very, very big uh, uh, feature to have, right? Just, uh, you don't have to have that IT subject matter, uh, subject matter expert 
um, to facilitate and manage all this for you. It's just done, again, right out of the box. Uh, the other thing is when, when you're moving to a, like a mobile solution, uh, even a thin client solution, you, you typically lose certain features, right? Features that require a high degree of processing, onboard processing performance, GPU performance, um, you know, a really, really robust client computer to perform some of these, you know, higher level features. Um, that is not the case with Eagle Eye. Our, our, our platform is built upon a, a REST API. And uh, the API is basically a one-to-one -one feature for feature uh, between our web interface-based uh, API as well as our mobile API. So uh, you, you, there are no feature losses depending on you know, what, what sort of platform you wanna access our system from. Um, and that means that you, know, you, you basically can deploy and manage uh, your, the entirety of your system with you know, the phone that's in your hand right now. So that's, uh, it's, it's very, very powerful. You, you don't have to worry about uh, having kind of a lesser experience when you're using, um, you know, our, our system remotely. It's, it's, it's built to do that, right? We want uh, all of the experiences, uh, you know, fr from a remote perspective to be exactly the same as it would on the on-prem um, using, using your system uh, while you're at your business. Uh, and then the last one, obviously, uh, we, we talked about it, uh, but it's, you know, cybersecurity concerns, right? So not a lot of people um, thought about, you know, if I'm going to be exclusively working with my system remotely, how do I make sure everything is secured, right? So we, we talked about that. I won't go in, into uh, too, too much further explanation about it, but obviously, um, you know, being, being able to do this securely gives you that, that peace of mind that, uh, you know, your, your data won't wind up as a YouTube video, and then that causes a whole host of other issues that you would have to deal with. Um, so... The other thing that we found is uh, people have been, um, our, our system allows for uh, us to employ analytics essentially on any camera that you attach to our system. And we found that uh, we, we, the certain uh, analytics that we offer um, actually uh, complement uh, the ability to manage uh, your business remotely uh, and, and sort of uh, think about COVID-19 related things that are now huge considerations um, when we're talking about opening up businesses, uh, getting the economy going, um, getting employees back to full capacity. And so we, we offer five analytics uh, just right out of the box, line crossing, people counting, camera tampering, loitering, intrusion detection. Specifically, the people counting and the loitering um, have been really big, uh, really really big features that can be deployed um, when, when it comes to, you know, COVID-19. Specifically, the people counting, what, we, what we've seen people do is they, they will put a people counter, uh, which really what it is is if you, if you have a, um, a camera looking at a door, right? So now you have your field of view. What you can do is you can superimpose a virtual line across the door's threshold. And as people come and go throughout that door, we will count the ins and outs of that door, we'll also calculate the delta, how many people are still in and how many people have gone, right? Um, and then we'll overlay that on a stream. And what people are doing is they are uh, using that to make sure that the businesses are adhering to uh, facility capacity uh, limitations, uh, you know, so we can adhere to social distancing um, uh, standards that have been given us to, you know, by the FDA essentially, right? So uh, being able to know and limit uh, and be alerted um, to too many people being in a business is, is a huge feature. Um, and then, and then the other one is going to be loitering, right? So um, I've, I've seen this um, in, in manufacturing, right? Where, uh, you know, manufacturers, if they're not making product, they're basically just hemorrhaging money. So they could not afford to, you know, limit the amount of people um, that are there to, you know, uh, you know, keep production going. And so some of the things that they had to do to limit the people that are there is, you know, they've had to take some of the, um, the infrastructure that sort of makes sure that uh, compliance is being adhered to. They've had to basically uh, make that, make that job uh, remote. And so compliance officers are using our system uh, with a combination of some of these analytics to adhere to certain compliance. So for instance, there are safety areas in like a manufacturing um, facility, right? That <clears throat> you can't, you can't actually be in during, um, you know, while the, the machines or whatever the manufacturing machines are, are running. Right. And so they use this idea of a loitering, um, box, which again, you, you have a field of view, you have your area that you want to surveil, you, you virtually superimpose a, a region within that area. 
And what loitering does is if anyone is to enter that area and dwell there for a, a, a user defined period of time, you can then receive a notification. And so we have a lot of people that are um, deploying loitering analytics to comply to safety standards. Um, where they've had to, again, limit the amount of people at these facilities um, to adhere to social distancing. But they're obviously, they, they serve an incredibly important purpose um, by making sure that, you know, safety guidelines are being adhered to. So, uh, you know, just the ability to, on the fly, uh, being able to deploy these uh, with your existing system um, and then obviously make someone, uh, it kind of force multiplies that person's ability when they're, when they're remotely trying to do their job uh, is, is obviously a huge benefit there. We've also seen, you know, other analytics, and we're going to get into this later uh, on in the month. Uh, we're going to have, I guess, uh, two more webinars, and one of them is going to address the specific topic. But we can also leverage analytics in other devices, uh, specifically thermal, right? So we've seen a big uptick in people wanting to employ uh, thermal technology to do uh, elevated temperature detection screening. Um, and being able to be alerted uh, when an elevated temperature is detected, getting away from having someone um, that is you know, doing a manual screening process and sort of automating that process, uh, you know, uh, making as people go into the facility, making that as streamlined as possible. So um, we are uh, very quickly uh, developing these types of thermal solutions to help um, open businesses up, get the economy back going. Uh, you know, by offering essentially a, an automated screening process here. Um, and one of the last things we're going to talk about uh, is going to be, uh, let me just read this. This is actually one of our customers from, from Planet Fitness, right? So they said, I, I felt at ease knowing that I had the financial flexibility to decrease the retention or, or adjust camera resolution in real time to lower my total cost immediately. So we are a subscription service. Uh, for every camera that you attach to our system, depending on its resolution and the duration that you store that at, we're going to charge you a, a, a specific fee. And so if we think about something like a gym, right, a, a gym, there, you know, the gyms are actually pretty good because they are a subscription gym. They don't really, you know, just because someone doesn't, you know, go there during the, the shutdown time doesn't mean that they're not being charged for their subscription. They have like annual subscriptions, right? But being able to, uh, being able to modify an existing OPEX cost that you're paying every month in real time just to save some pennies, right? They're, everyone is trying to cut down costs, right? When, when you don't have a, a, a business that's uh, open and running like a restaurant, like a, a retail store, uh, you're basically just hemorrhaging money uh, by paying rent, right? If you're not selling anything, you're in a lot of trouble. So being able to decrease costs dynamically during these times while still having a functional VMS is huge is huge, right? So uh, you, can, you can lower your retention. You probably don't even need uh, longer retentions at this point just because there's not as much activity. You probably don't need as high, high as resolution again because there's not as, as much activity and thus, you, you know, the ability to, to use high resolution video is not nece as, you know, necessary. Uh, this, is a, this, is, this is a huge thing. So being able to dynamically change how much your subscription cost is on the fly just to accommodate for whatever sort of potential uh, financial uh, impacts uh, that, that COVID uh, has and is going to have moving forward. Uh, really, really great feature. And uh, let's go ahead and summarize here. So we got a, we got a purpose-built cloud, right? We build it for, specifically for this service. Uh, we are not beholden to the larger sort of general cloud service providers. We're not um, you know, subject to their regression fees, their bandwidth fees. Um, and by doing this, this allows us to create a much more cost-effective solution uh, as we grow as a company, as you grow with us. Uh, we are a cybersecurity focused, centric, whatever you want to call it, product, right? Cybersecurity is number one uh, in our books. It is baked in fundamentally to our most affordable uh, subscription. Um, again, this type of level of, of cybersecurity is only possible uh, with other VMSs at, at a very uh, high level of, of subscription costs. So we're moving to their enterprise level products, more hardware needed, subject matter experts from an IT's perspective are required to implement this type of system. None of that is needed with us. You plug our, our, our device in on your premise, it attaches to our cloud, and now it becomes a cybersecure solution. It is as easy as that. 
uh, we are a uh, software as a service, right? So one of the one of the really interesting things, just like Netflix, if you notice that like Netflix, every time you log in, there might be a new movie, right? There might be a new uh, a series that they just released, right? They, uh, you know, w whatever it may be. So w what's cool about that is every time you sign into the, you know, Netflix, it is its most recent. It has its most recent features. It has its most recent content, right? Our system is very much the same. We, when we deploy a feature, we deploy it in the cloud, right? And it becomes immediately available to whoever is signed in, into our system. So we call this continuous uh, delivery um, of features. And we are constantly, you know, we're a software company. We're constantly trying to make our, our product better, more feature rich, uh, more performance oriented, more optimized, and so on and so forth. So uh, every time you use our system, it is its most updated version of their system. So there's no need to manage, update, do any of that stuff that you would have to do with a, a, a traditional VMS system. Um, and again, that's just uh, all, all cloud products are pretty much the, the same way is that, uh, you know, they, they throw updates through the cloud, you connect to the cloud. And therefore, you have the most recent version. So, um, very, very cool inherent feature of cloud technologies. Um, and then the last one is we we are really flexible um, as far as uh, being conscientious of your budget. And so we have options that are uh, more capex oriented options. So you know, sort of a, a higher upfront cost and a lower opex cost. And then the inverse of that, where we have a much lower capex cost and a higher opex cost. And then everything in between, you can actually mix, mix and match uh, to meet your budgetary requirements. So a lot of flexible options, uh, which is great for, for anyone that's trying to get into uh, you know, the cloud managed services game. Um, we can we can be very uh, nimble as far as what your budgetary requirements um, are, and I would re I would be remiss if I wasn't to plug um, some other cloud technology or partners that we work with. The first would be Brevo. Uh, Brevo is our sister company. Uh, Brevo we acquired Brevo. Uh, a few years ago, they are a cloud-based access control company. Um, they've been in business for 20 years, so they've been doing this for a very, very long time. We have a free and very robust cloud-based API integration with them. So by going and deploying a, an Eagle Eye and Brevo system, you get a, a very robust free uh, integration to leverage both those systems simultaneously in one interface. So that is a very cool force multiplier uh, when you're deploying um, both, both our technologies at the same site. And then finally, uh, Swift Sensors, which is uh, sort of, I don't know, I guess you call them our cousin company. Swift Sensors is another company owned by Mr. Dean Draco. This is a wireless industrial control sensor company that has a cloud interface, right? So all sorts of uh, interesting wireless uh, control sensors, pressure sensors, shock sensors, temperature sensors, flood sensors, everything in between. They're all wireless, which is in, in by itself its own sort of specialized technology, a specialized wireless technology, but more importantly, uh, it centralizes all of the data those sensors are picking up into a cloud interface. Um, again, we have really awesome, powerful integrations that are free between us and them. And uh, so you should check them out if you need any sort of industrial uh, control sensor needs. And with that, we'll go ahead and um, we'll, we'll open it up to some questions. Um, I'm going to throw it back to our marketing team. And uh, yeah, please, please let us know if you want me to expound on anything and uh, we, we will go from there. Thank you very much for listening, guys. Uh, I certainly do appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Matt. That was a lot of great info. Now I think it's a good time to jump into some Q&A. Reminder for everyone, now is the time if you have any questions, type them into the Q&A box of Zoom and we'll read them from there. So we actually have a couple questions already. So we'll go ahead and start with what are some options for people that already have a video surveillance system? Can they switch to Eagle Eye Networks? Yeah, absolutely. So whether you're using analog cameras or IP cameras, or maybe an, an HD over coax solution, you have an existing NVR or a server-based VMS, um, we can work uh, with them. So we can replace those devices. We can work with those devices with even another VMS that's deployed. Uh, we can take over any sort of technology 
uh, whether again, it's the analog, the IP or the HD over coax. And then from an IP perspective, we are, our interoperability standard is based around OnVIF, uh, which essentially all, almost all IP cameras comply. I believe uh, if you look at our, our camera compatibility, ca compatibility database, we're looking at over 3,000, 2,500 to 3,000 cameras that we support right now. And uh, what's really cool about our, our platform is provided that a, a camera is on VIF capable, we can build a driver on the fly as you deploy. So you can make use of whatever the newest, latest and greatest camera that's coming out from whatever manufacturer. You, we can just build that camera on the fly, integrate it, and there you go, you're off to the races. So a lot, a lot of cool, flexible options. Yeah, speaking of compatibility, another question is which thermal cameras we support or where can someone go to see which thermal cameras we support? Yes, absolutely. So um, on our website, een.com uh, slash cameras, uh, that's going to bring you to our camera um, compatibility database. We, su we support all the major um, thermal camera providers. So Axis, Mobotic, Sennel, FLIR, Hike Vision, Dawa, pre pretty much all of them. Um, and uh, again, we, we do this via OnVIF. And we are also working on some, some more specific feature-rich uh, functions by like pulling uh, alerts and metadata off, uh, temperature-based metadata off of the cameras uh, to integrate into our interface with a, with a even more select uh, few providers as well, which that will be covered um, later on in the coming weeks when we do our thermal presentation. But um, pretty, much, pretty much all the big players um, when it comes to the thermal, thermal stuff. And that, that's, again, that's become a really big... Uh, hot button topic. People are really, really curious about how they can implement uh, thermal cameras to do elevated temperature detection. And so we're, we're trying to play with everyone to be, uh, you know, as supported as possible within the industry. Definitely, definitely. So we have a question that came in regarding pools, and it's a two part question. It is, can Eagle Eye be used to count incoming and outgoing people that are coming into a pool area? And also, can it be associated with disabling a card reader? Uh, when uh, capacity has been reached? Yeah, we, so the first question is pretty straightforward. Yes, we can certainly do that. Uh, that is going to be very dependent on the placement of the camera, right? So we have a very simple analytic um, and it's gonna be able to uh, target or judge uh, a person as in the form of a target as they move through a, a virtual line that you're going to superimpose within that field of view. So for instance, if it's a pool gate, you're going to put a line around the entry point of that gate area. And as people go in and out of that gate, you can, um, you can detect uh, or, or count the people, the in and out. And again, we will show you that delta. Uh, and again, I, I can't drive this home enough is really, you, if we're gonna do this and we want it to be as accurate as possible, the camera placement is gonna be very, very key to this. And we basically want a camera that is as sort of close to that egress point and pointing down, right? So we can have consistent um, target shapes, right? The best target shape would be a top-down uh, perspective that is like kind of the tops of people's heads and their shoulders. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, having it um, facing, uh, you know, the front of a pool door, make sure it's a little bit elevated. Um, but yeah, we can certainly do that. Now, the second part of the question, can we lock a reader um, based off of a count? Currently, no, that is not, um, that is not a, an alert or notification we can send to the Brevo system to lock anything. But we are certainly, uh, I mentioned this uh, previously, we are, we are doing this sort of idea of continuous deployment where we're coming up with features. We have a lot of COVID-19 centric features that we are developing. And so that, that might be a possibility moving forward. I hope, I hope that answered your question. All right. It looks like that's all we can cover for now. If anybody does have any remaining questions, please reach out to us. This is our contact information. We're always available via call or email or also directly on our website. After this webinar, please check your email. We'll be sending out the recording as well as further information and an invite to our further webinars for this series. And thank you so much, Matt, for presenting today. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for participating. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks everyone. Stay safe out there.